for for reference for the future. So good afternoon. Welcome to Remote Work Wednesday. On behalf of the Remote Online Initiative and the K-State Research and Extension Community Vitality Team, we're, we're very glad to have you viewing our program today. My name is Ron Wilson. I'm director of the Huck Boyd Institute for Rural Development. Um, big thanks to Deborah Cole, who is program leader coordinator for K-State Research and Extension Community Vitality, uh, who is assisting with our technology. Um, this is a project of the Remote Online Initiative, which uh, uh, you'll, you're seeing this, the view of the website kansasremotework.com. Um, that particular, through that uh, link, you can get information about uh, taking the month-long online classes for uh, people to become certified as a remote worker or a remote work team leader, a remote work team supervisor, um, which gives us the opportunity to, to learn more about the practice of working remotely or in a hybrid uh, context. And the Zoom call is to support that. To, our purpose is simply to learn about the opportunities and challenges of remote or hybrid work. Um, this uh, this free call takes place on the second Wednesday of each month. Um, and uh, that leads us uh, to a, a note about next month, uh, the uh, August Remote Work Wednesday is about co-working spaces, and we're going to learn about a particular example in Plainville, Kansas, of uh, the hub co-working space, uh, another way for people to uh, engage with technology remotely, and we encourage you to join us for that. Today's presentation uh, is uh, uh, to learn about how the, the legal profession is uh, adapting to remote work. And it's a real treat for me to introduce Ashley Como, uh, JD, today. Um, it's interesting right now, the Kansas Department of Commerce is talking a lot about boomerangs, meaning people who are from rural Kansas go away, come back, uh, and how we, we value and appreciate those. And, and Ashley is an outstanding example of that. Grew up in Northwest Kansas, went to Fort Hayes State, got her law degree at Washburn. Uh, and uh, after practicing in Kansas City, she and her husband uh, came back to Northwest Kansas where she uh, uh, joined a, a law firm in Hayes and is working in Plainville as well. I got acquainted with Ashley when she and her husband uh, purchased a long time business in the area, Brant's Market, the meat market. And, and uh, so they're entrepreneurs as 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 well as their other pursuits. Most recently, Ashley was appointed by the Kansas Supreme Court Chief Justice to serve on the Rural Justice Initiative, which has to do with uh, addressing a shortage of attorneys in rural Kansas. Um, as one of those rural attorneys, uh, Ashley has observed the changes in technology um, and how uh, her law firm has adjusted to these uh, to remote and hybrid work. So as an example of a profession that is uh, adapting to this new technology, um, Ashley, please share your perspective on, on remote work uh, in, the, in the legal profession. Absolutely. So as Ron said, my name is Ashley Como, and I'm an attorney in Hayes, Kansas with Jeter Law Firm. Um, Jeter Law Firm actually has four offices now with our main and primary office still being located in Hayes. So um, as Ron kind of alluded to, there have been just in my time practicing since 2011. So over the course of 13 years, I've seen drastic changes in the way that we practice law. Um, when I started in Kansas City, I, I can remember one specific case that I worked on where I was paid to drive to Hayes in order to file documents um, because it was still, everything was by paper in Western Kansas at that point in time. We were of course filing online in federal court. We were filing online in a lot of Eastern Kansas courts, but we were not yet filing online in, in Western Kansas. And so I, I was excited and volunteered because I got to drive home and, and stay home for the weekend and be with my family. Um, but I had to get something on file in Ellis County District Court. And so I drove that packet of paperwork out to Hayes to get it filed. 
And that's definitely not the case today. Um, courts don't even accept paper filings, except when there are issues, um, of course. But by and large, um, all of our filings and most of our civil hearings are now um, handled online. Hmm. And so that has really, really led to, um, I think, the, the type of practice and the pivot that Jeter Law Firm has made um, just in the last few years, really. So um, I can go ahead and switch over to my slides now if, if that's appropriate. Um, let's see here. Right here, share. It's coming up. Okay. So as I said, it's Jeter Law Firm with, with four offices. Um, so our law firm actually has a, a long history. It was established in 1937 in Hayes. Um, it was established by Norman Jeter, uh, who was the father of our current partners, Joe and Bill Jeter. Uh, he served uh, Western Kansas from uh, 1937 um, for 70 years. He was actually honored by the Kansas Bar Association for 70 years of legal service, um, which is incredible. His sons, Joe and Bill, still serve um, with the firm today. They're both full-time here at Jeter Law Firm. Um, all of our uh, partners over the years and associates have a history of public service. So everyone from Norman who served for the Kansas Board of Regents, he served as a member and chair of the Kansas Board of Regents. Joe has been on the Kansas Judicial Council among many other boards. Um, Bill has been a former president and director for the Kansas County Counselors Association. He serves several school districts. He serves Ellis County. Um, our other partners and, and myself, we all serve on various committees. We serve on boards. Um, the Honorable uh, Supreme Court Justice Ed Larson was with our firm from 1980, no, 1960 until 1987. Um, and he's a recently retired Supreme Court Justice. Uh, Jerry Moran, Senator Moran served with our firm from 1983 until 1997. So long, long history of public service. And I think that that really plays into how our firm has transitioned over the years, because it's really about um, not only serving our clients, but serving our community and how can we do that best. Uh, our team today, which I've alluded to a little bit, we have six attorneys. Um, we really span, um, we, I think we, we really represent a good portion of, of areas of practice. We also have three Washburn Law alums and three KU Law alums. So we are split right down the middle from the state's law schools. Um, and we really have a, a pretty solid history in Western Kansas. Most of us are from the Hayes area. And so that also really plays into how our team has, has come to develop um, this interesting way of practice. Uh, our practice areas are also, as I said, really diverse, um, which represents the rural region that we serve. We, um, we represent everything from commercial operations, family farms, a lot of oil and gas, which is prominent in Ellis County and Rooks County, where I'm from. We have several partners that really specialize in that area of law. Um, but it really, it, it goes further than that. It goes into estate planning, probate, um, banking law, real estate law. Oh, here I have them listed. Business banking and commercial law, real estate, civil litigation, oil and gas law, trust, wills, and probate, and then school and government law. And actually that is one area of law that I've really seen um, struggle in the past few years. We, we've been contacted by several different counties, small, uh, small towns and small cities, um, even uh, local school districts looking for representation. And unfortunately, some of them have been far enough away, we just have to decline. But it is becoming more and more of an issue um, that when these small towns or small school districts need representation, they don't know where to turn because there isn't a local attorney either there at all, or there isn't a local attorney who can handle it. Um, and so those are really the areas of law that our firm primarily focuses on. Of course, there are exceptions and we, we do little things here and there, but by and large, that is what we practice. And so we've developed a, a practice where, again, everything, the hub is in Hayes. Um, we all work out of the Hayes office. It just may not be every single day of the week. So 
Um, one of our partners actually has relocated. He um, followed his wife's career and is now in Andover, Kansas. Um, she works at a university down there as a professor and, and as a therapist. Um, another one of our, our, well, two of our local offices have come about just because of our roots um, that, that the local attorneys have. So the first remote office was in Stockton, Kansas. Um, a local attorney, Ed Hageman, was, was retiring. And one of our partners, Michael Baxter, is from Stockton. And so it just sort of seemed like a natural fit to, um, to go ahead and um, take over his office location. The firm rented that office space and um, did actually um, acquire Ed's practice. And so that was a unique situation. And that's a little bit different than how our other offices have um, developed over time. But that allowed Michael, who grew up in Stockton, whose parents were still in Stockton, um, to go up to Stockton at least once a week. He usually is there on Tuesdays. Um, he goes up and sees local clients in his office there. He every week makes it to the courthouse and works on um, either some title research. Michael does a lot of oil and gas work for us um, and Rooks County is known for its oil background. And so we, we still have a lot of clients who need work done up there. So um, that's, that's where the Stockton office developed is through Michael's connection. Um, in 2020, when COVID hit, I started working from home a little bit. Um, of course, everything shut down as we know, everybody kind of um, stayed home for, I think it was about six weeks that I worked from home remotely. Um, but my husband and I had a small building that we owned in downtown Plainville. We hadn't done anything with it yet. And after about three weeks of working at home, I said, oh my gosh, I have to get out of this house. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get that building um, cleaned up and renovated so that I can at least go work from that uh, remotely. So at that time, I was just working on my computer um, and using my cell phone. And so it just took a little bit of paint, cleaning up. Um, we did add a few uh, walls, divider walls in the space. Um, so you can see there on the left, I, I have like a front area. And then in the middle, we put up two divider walls so that I have a conference room area. And it's really a perfect fit for just one attorney to have this nice little office. Michael has something similar where he has a private office space. He has a little lobby area. And then he has a, a place where he can sit down at a table and meet with more than one client if necessary. So after we had the, the Stockton and the Plainville office open, uh, the firm really started looking at, okay, if we're going to have these attorneys um, at least once a week in their hometowns, uh, we should probably think about our technology and how we can make that work better. So the way that we operate now, we have voice over internet phones through Next Tech for all of our offices. And so there is one phone number for every office. Um, we all call the Hayes number, any of our clients can call the Hayes number and our receptionist just picks up our extension and, and can call us and connect us with any client who calls into the Hayes office. We can connect with each other using these phones just by hitting the button for the extension as if we were in the Hayes office. So that has really, really been key to making this sort of a seamless transition into utilizing these remote offices better. We've also transitioned to an online cloud system for all of our file storage. Um, that cloud system allows any of us, even if we were to work from home, to just log in, um, be able to access all of our files, access what we were working on last in Hayes, um, and really uh, be able to pick up where we left off no matter where we are each day. So the really nice thing about having a remote office, um, I live in Plainville, and so I'm commuting to Hayes. Michael is the opposite. Michael lives in Hayes, but commutes to Stockton once a week back to his hometown. I live in Plainville, which is where my both of my parents are from Plainville. My husband and his dad are also from Plainville. So we decided to live in Plainville versus Hayes. And um, it allows me to not only work in Plainville once a week and take clients there locally, it also allows me to, you know, work from the Plainville office if my son has something going on at school that day and I don't want to drive back and forth for just three hours of work in Hayes. Or if it's snowing and the weather, you know, the roads aren't great, I can still go into the office because it's only three blocks from my house 
as opposed to trying to make that trip to Hayes or trying to work from home. So it, it really has been nice to have this space for the last four years and, and that the firm has really worked with setting us up technologically to be able to work from there as often as needed. Um, it also allows me, because I live in Plainville, even though I have a set day of Tuesday that I go to that office, um, if somebody says, well, I really can't meet on Tuesdays, but I have these other days available, I'll meet with them in the morning before I leave to go to Hayes, or I'll set them up at three or four o'clock in the afternoon and meet with them later before I go home, because I'm going to be going to and from Plainville anyway. So um, that has really offered a lot of flexibility. And then we now have a third, well, I guess a fourth office. In addition to Hayes, we have a small office in Wichita um, for our, par our partner, Tyler Turner, who relocated to Andover. So Tyler primarily, and I say primarily, he really only practices in oil and gas law. And so Tyler is all over the state and especially the Western half of the state um, often. So he travels a lot for work. He runs a lot of title and is, is in courthouses a lot. So he has a, a little office in Wichita where he can just go in and get out of the house, um, meet with clients if he needs to that are more in the Wichita area, um, and also have that you know capability of having the phone available, being able to talk to anyone whenever he needs to and so forth. So his is more of a remote work um, situation, whereas for Michael and I, it's more of we want to serve our home communities. Plainville didn't have an attorney. The only one um, who was practicing in Plainville for many years had retired. And then in Stockton, there are just a few attorneys. And so Michael really wanted to serve his home community as well. So each one of us has a little bit different um, situation and why we um, opted to have these remote offices. Um, but each one serves a purpose and, and really works well for our firm. So what it really provides me um, as, a, as a young mother and as uh, someone who chose to come back from Kansas City is a work-life balance that I don't think I would have anywhere else. So by having this little office, I can bring my son to work if I don't have daycare that day, um, if school is closed that day, if he's not feeling well, I'm the only one in that office. So I get him set up either, you know, with his tablet or with some, you know, crayons or paper or whatever. He doesn't bother anyone because I'm in my office there. Um, if snow days, he doesn't have school, he gets to come help me clear the sidewalk in front of the office. And so um, it also allows me to participate in a lot of downtown community events in Plainville. So if there's the homecoming parade, I might stay in Plainville that day so that I can see Calvin walk in the parade. Um, with his classmates, or you can see their little Halloween outfits. You know, we have downtown trick-or-treat in Plainville every year. And having my office there in Plainville allows me not only to participate in the event and have someone hand out candy for Jeter Law Firm downtown, but it allows me as a parent to have my kiddos there in my office and get to walk around downtown with them instead of having them go with daycare or a babysitter or a grandparent. I get to be there. Um, and so that work-life balance that that the remote office provides has really, really been beneficial um, for me and for my family as well. I don't have anything else to present on Ron, but um, I'm happy to touch on or talk about any um, aspect of, of my presentation or how this works for our firm that you'd like. Thank you so much, Ashley. That was outstanding. Uh... I, I thoroughly loved the uh, pictures of your son. Uh, the, the the Batman costume did a lot for me, but yeah, <laughs> that, that sweatshirt says, I'm not arguing, I'm practicing for law school. That is one of my favorite shirts that I have ever found for him <laughs> because he is good at it too. He comes by it naturally, I think. <laughs> um, I'll see what, what questions our participants have in a, in a second. Um, one thing I did want to ask you about, and it's certainly an emphasis in our remote work classes, is, uh, I don't know, cybersecurity, for lack of a better term. And in the legal profession, I can't imagine how imperative that is. Um, I'm thinking about um, electronic signatures, DocuSign or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So many things I'm doing now, it's just a touch of a button. 
um, is that uh, is that something you've observed? I mean, uh, in the old days, you know, good grief, we had to have uh, what's the word notarized signatures for this and that, and I'm really seeing that changing um are you you observing that change in the legal profession we are so not so much with DocuSign. You see it a little bit with real estate transactions, but for the most part, we still need a wet signature for most legal documents. Now, the difference is most legal documents, because they are filed with the court online, it's a scanned document. So I would say the biggest change is that I can now email out or um, mail, depending on the situation, send the document to my client, get their signature, and they can then scan it back in, get it to me, and I can file it online. So of course, we're careful and cautious with, with like you said, cybersecurity. Um, if there is any sort of um, really private information, like if there is a social security number involved, we tell them, please do not email that to us, mail it back. Um, but if it's going to be a public document, which most filed court papers are, there's really no harm in it being emailed to them and emailed back so long as they understand that, you know, it could become intercepted at some point via email. Mm -hmm. So we usually have that conversation with our clients. Um, and if it's going to be filed online, we just email it over, they sign, scan it in, email it back, and we get it filed. Um, there are times where we, like I said, I have to have the original document. So maybe it's a deed or something like that. We will mail it out to them so that they have the paper copy. They'll mail it back and we'll get it recorded with the courthouse. Um, I think the probably the, in my practice, the documents that I am most careful with are wills because you absolutely do not want those to get lost in the mail. And there are other examples like that too. You may have a contract that you just think this is our one and only shot <laughs> at getting it. And once this person signs it, we cannot lose it. So sometimes we we utilize other services besides U USPS mail, whether we take the time to hand deliver something or um, if we use you know, UPS overnight or FedEx overnight, something like that. Um, but by and large, we outsource a lot of our cyber and cybersecurity and, and all of that. So so we have a contract with a local company that provides all of our firewall and security, and they help us monitor what's going on with our email. Um, and then, of course, we contract with the cloud service that we use. Uh, it's made specifically for law firms. So mm -hmm. they are definitely aware of um, the importance of, of keeping things private and confidential. The efficiencies that are gained through this technology strike me. I think about you driving you know, three, four hours, whatever, to file a document. Uh, it, it's 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 really remarkable. Um, we're observing in the telehealth arena, different profession, but another important profession that uh, people are doing more consultations on Zoom remotely. It sounds like yes. you're still meeting with your clients in person when you can, but is there more of that going on as well? So we, we do see a lot of our clients in person, even if they are from two to three hours away, they generally come to one of our offices, um, whether it's in Hayes or whether it's in Plainville for me. Um, I, I see clients from hours away in both offices. Um, we do a lot of phone conferences, at least initially to get started. Um, and then they'll come meet with me to go over final documents and to sign, of course. Um, we have clients, you know, as far away as four or five hours um, that may come to see us, um, either because they have a long history with the firm or they're from the area and maybe they still own property here, things like that, that tie them to the region and why they choose to work with a firm here. In other instances, it's because there's only maybe one or two attorneys where they live and they're conflicted out of representing them for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. So they have to go further away. We see a lot of that. Um, I had a Zoom conference scheduled just this morning with a client, so we do that from time to time. But I would say, by and large, in rural Kansas, most people feel more comfortable still meeting with the attorney in person. And I think that that's where our remote offices really come in handy. Um, because even with Plainville being only 30 minutes away from Hayes, 
there are a lot of clients who might not make it to Hayes very often um, or who need to have a child or a caretaker drive them to Hayes, but they can get to my Plainville office on their own. And so they would much prefer to come meet with me in Plainville versus having someone bring them over to Hayes. Um, or they just may be from further north. And so it's closer to come meet with us in Stockton or Plainville than it is to drive all the way to Hayes. Now, I will say that we, my practice, I have been with this firm for four and a half years. And I came on right before COVID hit. So I have only been in court in person one time in four and a half years, because civil practice is just so heavily online now. And that really is, I think, beneficial because I have been in court all over um, Western and Central Kansas by Zoom for four and a half years. Um, I've represented clients in court as far away as Butler County, um, as far away as Phillips County, um, and even further West. So I think that it's really been helpful. And one thing that I emphasized when I was in meetings for the Rural Justice Initiative was that I was hopeful they would continue to offer that and that it isn't something that will sort of wane over time, um, that they continue to offer the Zoom hearings because otherwise I'd spend hours on the road um, and those hours could be spent meeting with clients or working on additional, um, additional product. So I think that we don't see as much Zoom use with clients, but we definitely see it with court. Interesting, interesting. I, I mean, I hear about, uh, you know, uh, in in criminal law or something, uh, 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 an, uh, whatever, I suspect uh, uh, the offender makes an initial appearance on mm -hmm. Zoom, um, whatever the initial booking. See, I have no clue what the process is, but well, and for, for criminal law, it may be different. And a lot of that is still in person, but it's criminal law is one area that our firm over time has just decided we won't practice it um, because we don't specialize in that. And so that's one area we refer out. And I do know they have more in-person court hearings than we do by far. Interesting. So when you were in Kansas City and that, you know, admittedly, that was that was pre-COVID, Mm -hmm. um, do you think the, the urban practices are moving to this technology as well? Oh, absolutely. They were, they were moving to it before I left. So the cloud, um, services that, that my firm in Kansas city had transitioned to before I even left there in 2015. Um, and so it, I'm sure they're all you know, working primarily this way. Now, do I think that it would work for a larger city firm to have remote offices and send someone out? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I think you really need someone with a tie to the community for it to work, um, especially for it to work long term. Because if, if um, a bigger city firm didn't have a tie to a community, but just saw it as a, a financial opportunity, I think the locals would see right through that. Um, and may not feel as comfortable going in and and meeting with with one of those attorneys. Um, but that's not to say that a bigger firm may not have an attorney with a tie to that community and a way for it to work long term. I just think that um, it's probably something that works best with a law firm that has a regional hub, um, whether that's Hayes or Dodge City or Colby or something like that for Western Kansas. Um, in my mind, I just think that that's why it works for us because Michael Baxter grew up in Stockton and, you know, goes back several, you know, generations. My family goes back five generations on both sides of my family in Rooks County and Plainville specifically. So um, it's always interesting when people come into my Plainville office and they hear my last name and they know me through my husband. But then when they find out oh, well, you're also so-and-so's granddaughter or, you know, oh, I know your dad. Um, those connections get made a lot more quickly and, and they warm up to me faster. So it, it definitely helps to have ties to the community um, if you want this to work long-term. Outstanding. Um, I wanted to ask you too about continuing legal education. Okay. That used to be in person. Had to, had to be in person, yes. Had to be in person. And nowadays, I suppose it was COVID-related, the transition to online? 
Yes, it transitioned. You, I think, Previously, now I'm not an expert on this. I think previously you could have a few hours of online CLE, but a majority of it had to be in person. And then when COVID hit, they allowed all of it, all 12 hours to be online. And so far that has not gone back. Um, and I will tell you from serving on our local Ellis County Bar Association board, um, I was part of the board that took our CLE, um, the Ellis County Bar puts on an annual CLE and it was always in person. It mm -hmm. took a lot of planning and a lot of money, frankly, to put it on uh, because we had to rent a space, they had to provide lunch, they had to do all of those things to, to make it work. Um, and there was usually, you know, a, a networking event either before or afterward that was associated with that. And so it was really cost intensive. And I was part of the board that took it online. We canceled it for 2020, but we took it online for 2021. And we've done it that way ever since. And it has really been a wonderful fundraiser for our nonprofit bar association um, because we no longer have the expense of the space. We no longer provide lunch. Um, and so those two big expenses went away. And what that allows our bar association to do now is actually funnel a lot of it back into legal related um, nonprofit projects or organizations in our community. So it allows us to donate money back to CASA. It allows us to donate money back to um, Kansas Legal Services or to other organizations. Um, we've donated money to Ellis County District Court has a, um, a like a drug um, program where they, they take drug offenders um, through like, I think it's a several years long program um, to really try to fully rehabilitate them through the court system. And, and we've donated money back to that as well. And so it really allows us to do a lot more for the local community um, by it being online. Um, it's also allowed us to provide really, um, I think, a better program, higher level of um, involvement. We, I think the first year we had almost 100 attendees, which was, I think, a record, wow. um, at least in recent years for, for that annual CLE. Um, and we had people from not all, only all over the, the state, but we had several from out of state who have participated because they wanted to maintain their Kansas license. Um, and so, you know, we've had Kansas um, appellate court justices present. We, we've had several people with um, other bar associations or local organizations. We've had professors from all over the state present and it really allows us to provide a robust program because they're now joining us by Zoom and they don't have to drive out to Hayes. Um, so that's also been really helpful. And I hope that it continues that they allow for all 12 hours of CLE to be online because um, while it's nice to get together in person and we still try to provide that through the bar at least twice a year, we have some sort of an event. We just had an annual bar picnic that um, we saw several people from around the area come join us for that for, for social networking. But it, it really allows attorneys in rural areas who are already driving a lot to get to places to just get their CLE, get quality CLE and get it done quickly versus having to drive somewhere for it. That's really interesting that the 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 technology does make it possible to access uh, resources, uh, speakers, uh, expertise yes. that uh, that would not have been so practical before. Absolutely. Uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, uh, let me just read this one. How long before the government and medical world stop demanding faxing and allowing us to use uh, scan email? Uh, sounds like in a lot of cases that, that that you are using scanning for your documents, but uh, any comment? You know, I can't speak to the medical world, um, but I, I definitely, I can take that off. Um, I definitely have seen it just recently change for us. So, um, you know, I think HIPAA makes it really difficult for the medical world to transition maybe as quickly as they should be. I know that a lot of facilities utilize um, specific, um, how do I want to say this? They, they use specific software that allows you to send things securely, but it's really clunky and it's really inconvenient when you have to log in and click here and then type this password. And, you know, um, sometimes when, you know, we represent a local 
um, hospital facility here at the firm. And sometimes it just becomes a point where we're like, hey, we're going to drive out and we're just going to come pick these documents up because we just can't get them to download. But I think a lot of it honestly has to do with HIPAA. So it's figuring out ways for um, technology to truly catch up to that um, area of law. You're also in an area of Kansas with with Next Tech, just to, you know, you alluded to Next Tech, you know, having the the broadband access and availability, not everybody has that. Certainly in rural Kansas, not everybody has that. And, uh, and no, and, it's it's true. And there are clients that, you know, I kind of broach the subject carefully, but I'll say, do you utilize email? Rather than just saying, hey, can I have your email address, please? Because you can't assume that they even use email. So it's always a, a question of, do you utilize email? How often do you check it? Okay, let, let me get your email address and I can send this to you. Um, it, it just depends on, on each client or each, um, each party that we're working with for sure. And actually fax is what a lot of people don't realize. Um, faxes come through email most of the time now. <laughs> so um, it's if they have the ability to email, it is much easier than sending the fax to my email. Um, Deb Oldie has a, a question. Um, when you started, the firm started looking at remote work options. Was there push, pushback? Were there some? Was there opposition? And how did you overcome that? And or if not, um, what did did have people come to see as the positives of of remote work for the firm? Well, I wasn't with the firm when Michael um, took over and, and started his office in Stockton. So I can't speak to that one as much. Um, for me, when I, I requested to, to start practicing in the Plainville office, of course, I already had the Stockton office to build off of. So that made it a little bit easier. It wasn't so unusual to them because they already had one remote office when I came on board. Um, I would not say there was pushback. I know there was discussion. Um, there was maybe a slight concern that after I built up my practice in Plainville that I might then leave the firm and go out on my own. Um, so I did have to do some reassuring that I truly love several things about being a part of this firm and working remotely in my office versus having my own office. Being a solo practitioner is very stressful. Mm -hmm. um, you spend probably, when we did our statewide study with the Rural Justice Initiative, I would say we came back with a lot of responses that said solo practitioners are spending about 40% of their time doing office management. They have to send out their own invoices. They have to um, make sure they're paying the bills. They have to take time to do their bookkeeping and, and pay themselves. And so all of those things take away from their time practicing law. And I didn't go get a law degree um, and, and do this in order to manage my practice. I did it so I could practice. Um, so that was a huge benefit to me with joining this firm was we have an office manager, we have three paralegals, and we have a receptionist and legal assistant who works up front for us. And I would never be able to find that kind of support staff or afford that kind of support staff on my own. So I reassured them I'm not leaving this structured environment <laughs> because I have no interest in running my own practice. And I think that alleviated a lot of their concern. That was the only concern that I know of that was discussed about me opening my Plainville office was whether or not I would eventually leave. Um, for me, I also really benefit personally um, from developing my skill set working with these five guys. You know, Joe Jeter and, and Bill Jeter have been practicing a long time. Um, they have a wealth of knowledge and experience, and I am probably in one of their offices almost every single day. Um, and, and that's part of always growing as an attorney. I mean, there is no one answer um, to any legal issue. It's always about developing a strategy and, and pulling from different ideas and figuring out how to make the law work for your client or trying to figure out how does this law work because no one is quite sure. Um, and it's really nice to be able to just go sit down in Joe's office or Chris's office or someone um, who is right around me in Hayes and say, hey, I have this question. What do you think? And bounce ideas off of each other. Or for that matter, in a crisis, if you're a sole practitioner, there's no backup. And, right. and you know, I can just see the benefit of at least having a team. Behind Absolutely. Absolutely. 
if you want to take a vacation, there is someone here answering the phone. There is another attorney who can take over your case if there is an emergency hearing or some issue that needs to be addressed immediately. Um, question, are there many folks who use their local library as their only internet or computer or fax or scan source? Uh, are, are there are there a lot of folks out there that that don't have any other option other than a public library or or some alternative such as that? You know, I'm sure that there are, but with the type of law that we practice, I don't see that um, because what we primarily do is we help clients with their assets. So we're working in real estate, we're working in oil and gas, we're helping form okay. or maintain businesses. So most of our clients um, do have access to internet, whether it's at home or at the office. Um, and so I don't personally see it very often. Now, there are times that I have um, older clients that may not utilize the internet, but they also aren't going to the library to get it. Um, so I, I would say that it probably exists, just not in my area of practice. Um, Ron, I did see in the chat, there was an early question that we may have missed about where I, um, where I do professional development and networking. Um, it's, it can be tough in, in a smaller rural area, but I think that because I work in Hayes, I do have a lot more access to professional networking on a more regional basis. And personally, I like to do it more on a statewide basis. So um, I do have times where, you know, either through our local nonprofits in Plainville, like through Downtown Plainville Inc., I get together. Um, I'm on that board. I serve as president currently. And so at least once a month, I'm getting together with nine young professionals who are all on that board. Um, with me working in downtown Plainville. So that's nice. Um, in Hayes, we have the Ellis County Bar Association. We have local chamber events. Um, so there is quite a bit of social networking, as long as you aren't looking just in that one small town. If you look out more regionally, it's really beneficial. And then on a statewide basis, of course, I'm on the Rural Justice Initiative. Um, I, I am on the Kansas um, Bar Foundation Board of Trustees. Um, so I'm going to KBA events on a statewide basis. I have been involved with Marcy Penner's group with the Kansas Sampler Foundation. Um, and so I love networking with that group of people as often as I can. Um, so I look further out for a lot of my networking opportunities. Thank you for addressing that. I, I wanted to come back to that. And then there's a stimulating question. What about artificial intelligence? Do you foresee a future where you could use AI to perform some of these functions? So it's interesting. I've just started dabbling with AI myself a little bit, but not in my law practice. So I think it would be really, um, you would have to use it very carefully because, you know, of course, any information you're putting into an app or into a service like that, you have to make sure you're not revealing any client confidentiality or creating any issues. Um, so maybe, may, and even, if, even from an accounting perspective, if you're putting out there what, what it is that you did for the client or how many hours you worked for the client that can start revealing client confidential, um, information. So I, I think it would be silly to think that AI won't come into, um, the law practice. And I know that it's already coming in somewhat, I personally already find it really beneficial. Um, again, I haven't used it in legal writing because I don't know that it's that advanced yet. But um, for some of my public relations work that I do both for my own personal businesses um, and for other things, I may just type in something on um, chat GPT and say, hey, how would you rephrase this? And I put in whatever, you know, couple of sentences I've come up with. And sometimes it helps me to more quickly get past a writer's block. So that's how I have personally used it is to sort of help me more quickly come up with a different way to write something. Um, but I do know that, you know, AI is developing really quickly. And I do think that it probably will come in to the practice of law in some shape or form, probably in the near future. Well, it's incredible to think about the changes in technology. Uh, the changes that you've seen in, in your short time, the changes I've seen in my long time, uh, it is remarkable. Uh, it seems to be accelerating the pace of change, and it, it, it certainly creates some great opportunities as well as challenges for for remote work. But uh, I, I my hope is 
my goal is that we can use the tools of technology wisely for the benefit of of our rural communities. Yes, and I think it's really important that not only law firms, but um, but the state of Kansas and and you know for local government to keep up with that technology. Um, we saw just with with the state of Kansas recently, our entire online filing system for for the district courts went down. It was hacked. Um, I don't know all of the details of that, but I do know that it went down for several months. And what that meant was we could no longer hop online and pull district court files. Um, if we needed to pull any sort of district court um, document, you had to drive to Topeka, you had to have an appointment, and you could only sit at that computer for about, I think, 30 minutes at a time. So for rural attorneys, that was really, really a, a rude awakening um, to the fact that it's not perfect yet. And while we have been operating on a lot of technology here in recent years, that could also fail. And so, um, of course, that was the best solution that they came up with immediately was you'll just have to drive to Topeka to come get these documents and to access these secure computers. But I think it was really important for um, for not only the state, but for for every law firm of every size to realize that you could lose this technology at any moment. And how will you transition and how will you uh, continue on practicing if you don't have it? So I think it's important to weigh both sides and make sure that you're capable of utilizing the technology, but that you're not handicapped if you don't have it. Interesting. Feels like horse and buggy after you're used to uh, instant yes. application, <laughs> pushing a button online. <laughs> yes, driving to Topeka to get documents um, really slowed down a lot of our, um, I would say, a lot of our cases that we were working on at that time. We just had to keep telling clients, we're so sorry, we can't access these documents, so it's just going to have to wait. Um, and we kept hoping it would come back online, and of course it eventually did. Um, so then you know, January, February is usually kind of a slower time following the holidays. And it was incredibly busy for us because that's when things started to come back online. So um, it it just depends on, you know, how well everyone, it, it can't just be one law firm that has all of this great technology. It depends on really the whole profession to keep up and to keep transitioning um, on the same path. Well, Ashley, we appreciate you being a boomerang and coming back to uh, rural Kansas and for your leadership with the Rural Justice Initiative and for sharing these examples of how how the legal profession can uh, can adjust and and reach out remotely to serve clients and to serve the legal profession. So I uh, don't see any other questions. I'm going to give you a virtual round of applause here. Thank you so much for your for your presentation today. And uh, uh, we we appreciate this and, and wish you well and your, your continued success. Thank you, Ron, I appreciate it. A uh, quick reminder, our next Remote Work Wednesday will be on August 14th, uh, second Wednesday of each month now going forward. We encourage you to register online and, and join us. Uh, we'll, we'll be learning about the hub an innovative co-working space in Plainville, Kansas. How did Plainville, Kansas come to be uh, two months in a row? Must just be a great community. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, we look forward to that. Um, <clears throat> I think there's no other questions. Thank you again, Ashley. We look forward to seeing you next month. And with that, uh, uh, we wish you uh, a very happy and productive Remote Work Wednesday. Thank you, everyone.